Okay, so today uh, me and Karen will present um, Langchain, which is a um, framework, orchestration framework for building LLM apps. Um, I will try to present in the perspective of a data engineer, as I'm a data engineer, and Karen will present it as a software engineer. We'll be, we will have the first part, it will be uh, like a theoretical as the setting stage and understanding generally what is a long chain and what, uh, how it compares to other tools. And in second part, Karen will present a demo and uh, it will be more, um, not on hands-on, but yeah, hands-on, you will see how to do it. And in the end, we will share both this, uh, both presentations and also uh, GitHub links to all the notebooks, whatever we did here. Uh, so just to present myself and Karen, uh, or I will present myself and okay, present Karen. Does. So I, I studied physics and did a PhD in biophysics. Um, I started my uh, science career, but then jumped into IT uh, after returning from the uh, after stopping my postdoc in Taiwan and returning to Armenia in 2014. Uh, it's, I worked in several companies like TeamViewer, Disco, and Crisp, um, uh, where I was a data engineer. I started my data engineering career in TeamViewer. And then I relocated to Estonia uh, to work at Microsoft. That was the main uh, reason. Uh, so Karen also, uh, Karen has a background in mathematics and <coughs> did his uh, master's in 2008. And, and he's, we basically are in, a, have same time starting career in IT. And he worked in T-Mobile uh, and EPAM. And now he works in the Snowflake, which is the very popular thing for a data engineer to be, but this is the opposite again. Um, so let's go, let's start. Uh, let's have a, some short recap. I'm not a data scientist and I'm not going to dive into like uh, details of uh, machine learning uh, for LLM. I'm going to approach it, uh, like ref give uh, some type of a framework of thinking about LLMs. And then we can go on and continue how we can use it as a software engineers or maybe data engineers. So I think I'm, so you better, you will maybe learn better than me from L, about LLMs, but just to remember, so the LLMs are uh, the case of the fund, uh, foundational models, like models the, which are needed to, to do general task um, generation on for different types of um, data, text, audio, video, and in particular, we're going to talk about LLM <coughs> for, but yeah, LLMs are in particular for text generation. And uh, this, um, let's say the breakthrough point uh, was when there was a, this uh, attention all you need paper published with transformer architecture. So if you are interested on, to understanding what is the architecture behind LLMs, uh, you can uh, read this paper or uh, different uh, explanations of this paper, depending on your knowledge of machine learning. But I will focus on I, that uh, on last two points and maybe add some point from me, how I imagine what is LLM and how we can work with that. So uh, basically we have this LLM, they predict the next word in a sequence. And this results in a compression of knowledge. So basically they are compressed sets of knowledge. So whether it's our internet text data or other specific uh, data for your domain, they are a compressed representation of this knowledge in the network, in neural network. Another analogy that is, um, comes from uh, Andre Karpate, uh, like well-known data scientist uh, um, in the field. Um, he uh, presents, uh, he, uh, he says, let's uh, think of LLM as a um, main component, CPU of the LLM OS, of a new operating system or a kernel uh, of this or kernel process of this system where LLM is the CPU, the RAM is the wi um, context um, window of uh, LLMs, so, you know, like now it's growing. Uh, it started very small, like <laughs> memory in our computers, it started small and now it goes uh, to millions of tokens and uh, it, there is some kind of analogy again here, like back in like 70s, people were thinking why we would need six, more than 64 kilobytes of RAM and we should be able to do anything. And now we also think why we would need uh, 1 million tokens or like uh, for a window. Let's see, I think this uh, we will be um, um, surprised how this will be applied. Uh, the other uh, per peripheral parts of this uh, OS, uh, the storage, the disk is, uh, um, are embeddings. We will talk about embeddings in the later um, 
slides. Uh, then we have the connection to internet. Internet, it's a browser. Uh, we can also talk to other LLMs. We have uh, peripheral devices like video and audio inputs. And we have software, which are basic or other ways they are called also tools. Like it can be something simple, calculator or uh, terminal, but also Py uh, Python terminal or ID or uh, different now tools that, uh, as you can see, other companies are integrating to LLMs. They're like in the building um, uh, assistance. Um, so this is what uh, one thing to think about LLM. And I, I think there is also an analogy that Karen said, like we can think it about it as an engine. So we invented, uh, it's a new type of engine, like it was an uh, internal combustion engine or something else. And now we need to attach uh, now we need to integrate into our production system so we can use this engine. I also, as a data engineer, for first thing I was thinking, okay, this LLM looks like a lot of, like a specific type of a database. So it has compute powers and it also stores data. Uh, and so it can generate data uh, based on uh, my queries. And again, we call it queries. So I often imagine this is a new type of a database. Uh, let, we'll see if this analogy holds on in the future. But this is what uh, we can think about uh, LLMs uh, in the context of this talk. Um, okay, great. We have the, uh, this compute functionality, we have the storage functionality, generates data, but LLMs, they are um, generic. They are pre-trained on generic data. And um, basically we don't, we cannot easily use with our data. What are the approaches to use LLMs and make them domain specific? There are three approaches, um, starting from simplest up to most uh, complex and most uh, expensive. So the simplest approach is, you heard this term, prompt engineering. Some people even started uh, think the career in prompt engineering, but this is, uh, this is the same thing as you maybe work with Excel uh, or something. You write uh, some functions and then you, you can do maybe one off or two times. Like the, it's not, it's manual. It's not, it's hard to automate. And um, it's, but it's easy. It's easy. You just write some nice uh, prompt and you put as much data into that prompt as you can. And here we think, okay, uh, now we can put like 32 kilobytes into this prompt, maybe it grows to 1 million and we put everything there. But it's not only about ability to put information into prompt, it's about automation. And since we are talking in the context of software engineering, it's also about how we're going to integrate with our system. And integration with just prompt engineering, it's not effective. But it's low cost and easy to start. So it's a first step and uh, also a good skill to have because uh, the other uh, technique that we are using, it's also under the hood has uh, some parts of prompt engineering. And this will be like uh, the one of the important uh, parts that we will talk. Uh, so the other approach to bring, to make LM domain specific is using RAG, retrieval augmented generation. And uh, maybe you heard about it, maybe not. It's now kind of a hot topic uh, and it's I will talk in details uh, uh, about RAG in the next uh, slide, but basically RAG allows us com to combine uh, prompt engineering with um, retrieving data from external sources. And we will go through architecture of RAG. And it sits, uh, it's a bit more complex because you need to build something, you need to have some coding, uh, and we will see how a line chain makes it uh, smooth and easy and pleasant experience for us. Um, but it's more complex like prompt engineering, but much cheaper and much easier than last approach, the fine tuning. So if you are a data scientist, you may think, okay, uh, let's um, further train our data, our pre-trained LLM on labeled and more spe domain specific data and make it uh, uh, good for, I don't know, code generation of my company. So you have the, your code uh, and you want it to work, understand maybe business domain and also uh, have a good insight in your code base and work uh, so it will be able to answer the questions related to your code base or other business uh, related uh, questions. But this one is uh, both, not only it needs some um, uh, knowledge of data, uh, you need the machine learning engineers, you need uh, training capacity, you need uh, 
uh, it will cost you uh, not as ex expensive as pre-training all them, but still it will be expensive. And it's not something that you will, each time you get new data, you are going to, okay, let's, uh, let's fine tune it, let's run training. So it's not a that fast a process and uh, latency is much higher in this case. In previous two cases, there is almost no latency. You just uh, write a prompt, or uh, you, we, will, we will see with RAG, we integrate with external data sources, we expose uh, uh, our uh, system to external data sources, and it's already available to use them. Uh, with fine-tuning, it's uh, much complicated. Uh, so um, that's why, uh, why I was trying to uh, mention these two things, just to understand why we focus on RAG and how RAG is leading us to a long chain and uh, and far, farther. So let's understand what problems RAG can solve uh, be, besides the fact that it can be uh, cost efficient or uh, m help us to automate stuff. So RAG also it's, well, it's not very recent, but it's becoming popular uh, more recently. Uh, it was introduced in 2020 uh, uh, and uh, now it's becoming more like, again, like generic terms there are different uh, variations of RAGs and uh, uh, improvements on top of that. But basically RAG helps us address these uh, four challenges. And uh, I just, uh, maybe just to step back and good, give you another um, imagination uh, and uh, another understanding about this or example about this approach is it's, um, it's the approach with the exam. How we can, uh, let's imagine we have a student and we want to, we ask the student a question. So prompt engineering will be the case when we just uh, have a nicely curated uh, questions uh, in our uh, exam. And then we ask this uh, um, student, which maybe is a bachelor student of physics and he, he she knows general uh, knowledge of uh, physics. And then we ask the questions and student uh, replies. But we don't know which particular, um, from where the student knows about this, uh, just uh, maybe uh, this person learned from somewhere, which book, which course, we don't have any idea. Uh, RAG, with RAG is the case when you say, okay, you know the general uh, physics, I will give you a book, a domain specific book, maybe statistical mechan mechanics. And I want you to use that book and your understanding of physics and uh, answer my questions about statistical mechanics. And this way, uh, the student will open the book and not only uh, try answer my questions, but also point me on where does this understanding come from? Where, from which parts of this book the student uh, managed to answer it? So this is the rug. And finally, fine tuning would be if I say, okay, um, this is the sp special course, this is a domain specific course, you, you go and train for it and then you come to, for, to exam without any book and I will ask you questions so you will uh, memorize everything and then uh, answer me. Uh, what will be another benefit not only having this data in terms of fine tuning but also the student maybe will be more fluent in using a correct terminology or doing a correct uh, uh, thinking more correctly about that specific domain uh, not only just having knowledge, but again, the rag sits in between and g it gives us um, good uh, value for its uh, price not to in that we can invest on both in terms of development and in terms of uh, compute cost. So coming back, so what are the main the problems that we want to solve with uh, pre-trained LLMs? Um, <clears throat> And uh, when we say pre-trained, we talk about the specific uh, models. Maybe you heard about them, these large models, the, uh, I don't know, Gemini or OpenAI's uh, models or this uh, Cloud and so on. But then what is the fine-tuned example? It can be like Copilot for GitHub, which is pre-trained specifically for code or maybe even smaller uh, uh, models uh, or for smaller, for smaller data set. So first of all, as we were talking about this analogy with the student we can see that um, there, is the, there are some type of inaccuracies with, uh, you, if you ask the question, uh, since we have a data, uh, we use data up until some point, the, this LLM, which is pre-trained LLM, will contain only information about un up until some time. And if the, there something changed or some event happened, or maybe uh, something in, let's say, physics changed and uh, there is new uh, insight, uh, then this uh, LM would be would 
it will definitely answer, and it, the answer probably will be wrong and outdated. So the RAG approach, it allows us to limit to uh, answers to specific data sets. So if there's no da uh, data information about this topic, you, you don't give me answer. So I either get correct answer or I don't get nothing. So I get uh, also, I, I just don't get some generation uh, of uh, text which is uh, maybe not relevant, uh, which leads us to hallucinations. So in case of hallucinations, again, um, it's not only having this data, but being uh, correct about this data. Uh, and uh, w the, in, this, uh, in a sense, the RAG allows you to co connect this, uh, to ground this uh, uh, the LLM to your data. It's uh, to verify data and not just uh, whatever um, uh, combination of data it already had. Uh, how we can check if it's correct or not, we can, with RAG we can say that give me also the, all the citation to to that data that you now use to reply to my question. If you used, I don't know, uh, this LMS or maybe Bing, or it always give you uh, uh, some links that it used uh, to reply to your question. Uh, so that's what the, uh, it, use, it is using. And finally, as I mentioned multiple times, it's much more cost efficient. There's no um, uh, fine tuning cost. And uh, that's why it's like uh, very, uh, is approach for engineer to pick up and start to use it and integrate with their systems. But how it's how is it done? So, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, one uh, there, this is the like generic architecture for uh, RAG, and uh, some uh, parts are more important and some are more optional to improve at performance. Uh, I will start from the end, maybe sometimes going uh, back and forward to explain uh, each step, why it uh, helps, because just uh, going forward, maybe it's not very clear. So the first step is obviously, <coughs> if we want to <laughs> expose a LM to our data or use our data, we need to load this data. We need to be able to extract this data. And uh, with, uh, as we will see with uh, Langchain and other tools, they have very good integrations with different data sources, which will allow you to bring in unstructured data, structured data, web, like data from using URLs, p different documents up to even PDFs, and, and also connectors to different databases. So this is simple. Okay, we got some type of connectors. We are connecting to our data. Then the other step is, okay, how, uh, if we just take this data, let's say we have uh, PDFs, each document is like one, if we have books, so we want to uh, bring in some books uh, to use. Uh, if we just feed these uh, books without manipulating this data, they will be really big and uh, then it the, uh, will be hard to just uh, use them. In terms of, for example, if we want the citation, it will say, okay, I use this book, but the book is huge and you cannot point specifically where in the book, which part of the book was used for this generation. And also, when I will ask a question, uh, this one book can match multiple times, and it will be also, and I, this one book will be always loaded to the context, because in the end, we are talking with uh, our LLMs using context, and context is what? It's money. So larger context, you pay more. So that's why we want to take small chunks of data, which are most relevant, it's like, like throw away all unnecessary parts, that needed to answer your question, take these parts and feed it to the context in the end, uh, and th this way like reducing the cost and making more precise uh, citations. So this next stage is splitting. Uh, okay, then there's the storage stage or indexing stage. Uh, the, what is indexing? So first of all, to use our data, LLM should understand uh, our, how it can connect our questions to this data. And this connection is done, um, uh, semantically it's done using embeddings. What is embeddings? We embeddings are basically, we take text, convert it to some uh, multidimensional vector, embed it into this multidimensional dat uh, database or space. And if there, when there is some question, this question is also con uh, embedded, converted to this multidimensional vector space. And in this vector space, they are compared if they are in the closed space or not. If they are in closed space, it means they're semantically similar or related. It's not just comparing words uh, in these questions or uh, our data set. So the, this embeddings allows us to do a semantical comparison 
And that's why maybe you heard recently the like, rise of these vector databases and so on. But uh, I personally don't think like, uh, that m many of them will live true because other vendors, like traditional database vendors, they probably will add support also for vectorizing their data sets. And uh, you will be able to have the re vectorized representation of your data, existing data. That's my uh, point of view. But basically, we get this data, we split it to make it more relevant, and put these chunks into vector store by embedding. Embedding is also, again, we think about co it's a bit costly, so it's not coming free because to embed into this this text into to this vector store, we need to use um, special type of LLMs, special uh, models, which are cheaper a bit uh, usually than using just uh, LM, large LLMs. But again, they require some compute, uh, some tokens to do this conversion from text to vector. Um, after, and then the comes that finally the retrieval, uh, the important uh, letter for RAG. And retrieval is basically this process where you ask a question or you prompt or do you could do a query. And then the LLM ta takes this prompt, embeds it into a vector, uh, vector uh, not embeds it, com yeah, converts it into a vector and queries your um, database, your vector store, and asks, give me relevant chunks of data uh, for this uh, uh, question. And Karen will show how it's done and you, all these steps have uh, multiple ways to uh, configure, to improve, to uh, uh, like uh, play uh, with all the knobs and to change like how, how we, you want split, which net vector store you want to put, when you retrieve, how many top uh, matches do you want to retrieve. But this is, uh, these are the details. Basically, the important is we get the document, the chunks of the document that are related to our question. And then all, together with our question, we feed it to our LLM and LLM will generate corresponding output having knowledge of our uh, data. Uh, and this is basically RAC, how it works. Um, and um, now, where does RAG lead us? So if there was this RAG architecture and to implement RAG architecture, uh, there are different tools. Uh, some are specific for that, uh, some uh, are more advanced, but this is where uh, does this log chain and other framework come into, the, into play. Not that they only do RAC, but this is where like uh, first maybe uh, or most uh, applied cases and now they are evolved into much more and Karen will show uh, how much uh, long chain grew. And this uh, slide, uh, if we summarize it very shortly, I will go through this uh, each point, but to summarize, this is about the stars, maybe, just to justify why long chain, why not other maybe 100 tools that now are popping out. Uh, so basically, long chain now is the most popular orchestration framework uh, for orchestration uh, LLMs. Uh, and uh, it grows and it becomes like, uh, again, uh, go to solution for uh, RAG and beyond. But there are all the other uh, options and I want them to present you, not that they are <laughs> designed by Microsoft, but because they are also uh, maybe uh, have a bit shift towards enterprise solutions and other benefits. So the other one popular uh, framework, which is like mostly about RAC and not uh, about other functionality, it's uh, Llama Index. And uh, if you want just RAC and maybe you are familiar with this approach or you want also it Pot as a lang chain, it also supports JavaScript, but maybe you just need uh, something simpler, but only for Rack. Maybe you can choose Llama Index, so it's worth giving a try. But as you can see, uh, it's not that popular. Uh, other, uh, like not competitors, but alternatives are semantic kernel, which if you are, let's say, in the enterprise uh, setup and you have your C sharp uh, as a main programming language and you are in this ecosystem and you don't want to. It also has Python uh, uh, API, but again, uh, the main uh, description is like, if you want to integrate your enterprise application with LLM and expose uh, and call, make eight, uh, different um, calls uh, using LLM as a main agent who will decide which part of your application to call. So to give some agency to your application, semantic kernel is a good alternative. <coughs> Finally, uh, as I said, it's not only about uh, RAC, 
And now we see that growing uh, popularity, which also uh, Karen will show how to do with Langchain, is using agents. So uh, we can also, because if you maybe notice that with RAC, it's like specific uh, flow what you do, and there is no much space for variation. But we will see that with agents, we can give more uh, autonomy to the LLM to decide what to do and what should next step be and which tools to use. So for this type of uh, um, approach, uh, there is the Autogen, which is a framework based on more this using multi, uh, multiple agents and groups of agents to, per to perform some uh, work using also your d data or integrate to your application. And uh, finally, I, uh, since we were talking about um, uh, we are in PyData and there should be something related also to specific data use cases. There is, uh, I found out recently that there is this task weaver, which is um, a way to use uh, LLM as an agent for uh, planning and executing data analytics tasks. So it's uh, most benefit of this framework uh, compared to all others that it not only stores the history of uh, your prompts and queries and whatever you did, but it also stores the data uh, and operation that it did with data. So it's uh, very specifically designed for these use cases. And uh, actually, it is possible that you are already using Langchain. Uh, if you use, for example, Spark, uh, uh, PySpark specifically, uh, then if you try this English SDK, so you, if you try to write a, a questions into PySpark and ask to process your data frames. Under the hood, it basically uses Langchain. Uh, and uh, it's nothing, something magical. It's a very nice integration. And they took the, the data for <laughs> Spark uh, APS, uh, Spark documentation, added some tools. And now you can ask questions to uh, uh, um, give instructions to PySpark so it will analyze and transform your data. So, so many people, I think, are more exposed to it, uh, to this type of use cases where the uh, Langchain is used already under the hood. So from here, I will hand over to Karen uh, and to continue. And in the end, if you will have questions about my part, I will be happy to answer. Uh, I think I will. Thank you, and thank you for coming. So let's start from something, and we start from Hello World. This is how Hello World looks like, right? And uh, the basic concepts of Langchain, talking about Langchain, uh, I need to say that it's not just a one library. Now it's a growing ecosystem. So we will touch uh, a little bit like the Langchain core, some uh, stuff from community, some uh, proposed architectures and but also now on the top of long chain they have a lot of things they have a uh, a lot of template repositories where you need to implement some specific architecture or specific trick they are, have a just a github repository template repository that shows how to do that if you need to expose your chain uh, as a uh, REST API, they also have uh, a library called uh, LangServ that uh, allow you to uh, uh, expose your chain as REST API. And, uh, and they have a commercial product, uh, LangSmith, uh, that uh, built around monitoring and testing and tracing and evaluating your chain. So if you actively work, you need to compare some metrics, run it against different sets of questions and answers and check, does your change actually make it better or worse? You have uh, instruments for that. But as I said, today we will mostly work on uh, these uh, examples from uh, Langchain library itself. And yeah, here's the first example. So mm, probably the best way to start this uh, will be just show you a code. And here what we have, we have some primitives from uh, Langchain, right? We have chat open AI model, the just a wrapper class around chat open AI uh, REST API actually. We have a prompt template, which is a, uh, again, normal template, as you can imagine, like Jinja template files or, or whatever. 
And uh, we have some uh, string output parser uh, about this a little bit later. But yeah, then we uh, uh, initiate our prompt. We will use a chat model. So what is chat model? Like usual LLMs, they are uh, basically the base models they are created to uh, do uh, next word prediction, right? But there are some fine-tuned versions of them that uh, fine-tuned on chat data. So they are actually can uh, uh, like respond you with in, in chat format. Like they, they have uh, understanding of message, so you give them the set of message and they return you the next message. Something like that. And uh, the chat OpenAI uh, model like this GPT-4 Turbo, it's exact that type of uh, model. That's why here we have this kind of message history or just our prompt where the first uh, message is a system message and the second one is a user. And here in uh, system message, we just instruct our LLM to say John to us. And then we put anything that uh, user will say. Again, you can use text here. You say, say something like, tell me joke about, and then use some variable, right? Uh, so then you can just place this, substitute this uh, value of topic. But uh, let's just put the whole uh, user input. So we assume that it will be the question itself. So yeah, uh, let's see. And then you, how you can combine uh, these two parts, uh, prompt at LLM, mm, in very natural way. So we create chain with this pipe. Uh, and then, uh, so we, uh, we call chain invoke and give some input. Uh, we, we give a dictionary with key input, right? And say, hello, I don't know. Uh, I am Karen, right? And uh, who are you? So we uh, ask this, and what's happened? This input goes to prompt, right? And this uh, input substituted with this, hello, I am a Karen, and who are you? Then this prompt goes to LLM. Actually, LLM generates based on that prompt and return you an answer. So let's see, let's run it. Yeah, and uh, it's returned us with uh, AI message. So this AI message is also wrapper from Langchain, but uh, whatever, we can see that here we have content, hello, Karen John, I am digital assistant here to help you with your questions and tasks you might have, uh, blah, blah, blah. But please pay attention, it says Karen John. It's always good. Uh, yeah, but if you want to see just a text, not, not a, a whole AI message, we can add this, um, output parser, again, uh, pipe it with just pipe operator. So the output of LLM, in this case, AI message, will go to output parser, and output parser is also something from uh, Langchain uh, core that will just uh, give you a uh, text itself. Like, let's say you are on PyData Meetup, say something to our audience. Uh, yeah, it says hello everyone, John, and welcome to our PyData Meetup. It's fantastic to see so many data enthusiasts gathered here today, eager to share knowledge, learn, and connect with one another. Whether you are a seasoned data scientist, a beginner diving into the world of Python and data analytics, or somewhere in between, you are in the right place. Okay, so you are in the right place, so let's, let's try to understand what's uh, happening. And this chain, it's actually, if you need some illustration, you can imagine this uh, like visual chain, right? First you have input, like, hello, I am Karen, or you are uh, on PyData Meetup. Then it goes to template, that template produce prompt value, then prompt value goes to chat model, actual LLM call happens there. Then uh, chat model returns us with chat message, then parser parse just uh, output, and you see the uh, response with a string. 
OK, so Habet is not here, so let's break some rules. Uh, does anyone have any question so far? I will show you a code. So please ask if it's a really interesting question. No? If not, we can continue. Is, is everything simple and uh, understandable, or it's like too difficult that no one wants to? Uh, we have uh, time for stupid questions, like after after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can ask question. Uh, you create a chain with prompt, with prompt and lamb and auto parser, and then invoke the input. Yeah. But Buffer, uh, executes after the invoking or before this? During. So uh, see, when you invoke, right, what's happening, then this input goes uh, through sequentially mm. through all steps oh, of okay. chain. Okay, so yeah, that's what uh, this uh, uh, picture about. So input goes to prompt template yeah, yeah, and, and whole chain. Yeah. Because usually I write <laughs> it's after Yeah, yeah. Working. So the, okay. you, you need somehow visually. That's why it's not just a like normal Python. It's a specific like domain specific language mm -hmm. that Langchain introduced recently. Previously, it was just a Python functions, but now with this, they call it L cell, like uh, Langchain expression language uh, with this pipe syntax. And we can see that in many many cases, it's more visually. Uh, easily to understand. Yeah, very cool thing. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, so let's go to next next uh, example. Yeah, and uh, Gore talked a lot about rug, right? And in rug, it's like a general idea. And then you have a lot of places to improve uh, you, how you retrieve your documents, how you load them, how you chunk them, how you like, uh, check what is really relevant and what you can do. And many, many interesting stuff goes there to improve that. Right now, we will not talk about that specific things. I will show you kind of the main idea, the architecture. And in order to show that, as we talked, we need, uh, we will have a vector store, simple vector store with some sentences. We not now uh, work on loading them from somewhere or chunking them. Or we just have a short sentence, it's already prepared, and we use in memory uh, vector store. Like usually in production solutions, you need to have it like persistently as a separate service or whatever. But in this case, we will just use in memory vector store from, again, uh, it's a tool, tool or how you say it, uh, vector store from Langchain community package. So community contribute to uh, Langchain packages a lot, so uh, yeah. And what we will do, we just embed these sentences. We transform it to vectors and put them in, in some uh, vector space, where, where, where then we can ability to query it like based on semantic uh, meaning. And yeah, here we have like who works where, Harrison works at Langchain, Karen works at Snowflake, Gore works at Microsoft, Habet works at AUA, and beers like to eat honey. And we also give embedding model. So embedding model, it's a model that is responsible for taking a text and produce a vector. So it's pro that's why we need uh, embedding uh, model here. And let's run it. Yeah. And now we can create a retriever from that. Uh, so we just uh, create a retriever based on from our vector store. And we say that for each query, we want to get back two most relevant documents. So when I say documents, in this case, documents is just this one sentence, right? So if we have, uh, we have our retriever, now we can call our retriever uh, based on most uh, semantically uh, similar uh, sentences. And if we ask like, who likes to eat honey, like, it returns you two documents because we specify to return always two documents. And first one will be like beers like to eat honey, but the second one will be Habit works at AUA. I have no idea why this is also semantically uh, most uh, common from from the list. Okay, so let's let's start to write our uh, uh, rug. 
right, our rack chain. For that, we again need prompt, and in this case, it will be template, like answer the question based uh, on the following context, and then we will put the context, our relevant documents, right? And then we also put uh, user question there, and they will say, please answer, I don't know if the context is not enough to answer a question. So this is a main uh, template for our LLM call. So here we have two variables, context and question. So somehow we need to populate this template with two variables and only then do a call to uh, LLM. And uh, yeah, and again, we initiate, it will be the chat open AI model and uh, we use output parser and we will uh, create some small chain that's preparing the prompt. Basically, it should get a context for us and, and pass a question. So uh, what we say, we say, hey, please run in parallel our, uh, our retriever with input and put the output of retriever under the context key. And also, please take an input and uh, put it under the uh, question key. So then we will use this dictionary with context and question to uh, kind of render our template. This uh, syntax could look some, a little bit strange, uh, but, but uh, after you work with it a little bit longer, uh, you, you start to like, get used to it. So what's happening here, then you have uh, as a, so our final chain looks like this. You have the setup and retrieval chain that do two things. It gets context and question based on input, of course. Then it passes it to prompt. Then you have like uh, prompt with substituted values. Then it goes to model. And then we give the output of model to uh, output parser. So re we return just a row string. So let's ask something like where Gore is working. Or, or maybe you can ask some other question based on this. It's about who works where, so let's ask about Gore. Uh, yeah, it says Gore, Gore works at Microsoft. So, and it's a, uh, uh, it's a generation, uh, you can see, so at least you can see there a dot here. So it's not just a document from, from a, a vector store, it's a generation based on that document. And again, to semantically understand what's happening, we have this chain. If you want to visualize this, what's happening, right? So first you have a question. In our case, question is where Gore is working. Okay, but this question goes to uh, a retriever and uh, query retriever with that question. And also it goes to this runnable path through. It's a primitive from long chain that essentially says, whatever you will receive, just pass it through to next step under the uh, question key <coughs> that we specified. So then retriever returns us a context from retrieve documents and uh, this runnable path through just adds a, a key question and stores the original question under that uh, in uh, dictionary. Then using that dictionary, we render our template, we uh, give template to chat model and chat model answer us with chat message. Again, we uh, parse it with uh, string output parser. Uh, any questions here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the output parser. So if we remove it right now, like will the answer just be the response message from chat GPT the same? Yeah, yeah, it will be AI message, the same message with some additional stuff like with some meta information, but can, not. Can we please remove it and of see Of course the... we can. Everything happens live on stage, you know. So let's remove it, right? So let's run it and then ask. You just return you AI message. So string parser is something that it's not do a call. It just uh, returns you a class. It has content, but it also has response metadata about token usage, about like how much tokens on uh, request, on red generation, what model used and stuff like that. Yeah, this is the exact GPT response in, like, in other calls, right? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. thank you. But the, the trick here is just we use this template and we pass relevant information, yeah. The parser here doesn't do anything very interesting. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe like another question, last one about this part, and then I go to my last notebook. No, no, okay. So this whole stuff is very like interesting, but uh, right now we just go, like we specify a flow and then we go through that flow, right? We don't give any like free view if you want or whatever, some agency, agency to our LLM. So we not um, give the ability what to do, right? And the idea, of course, what we want, we want autonomous agents, like then they will decide and, and, and then uh, plan and, and execute and make us very, very happy. So the, the main idea here uh, is somehow bring uh, LLM ability to do some stuff. And after it has this ability to do something, send email, I don't know, uh, sell stocks, buy stocks, whatever you want. Uh, since it's uh, good at generation, so maybe it can decide to take some action, take that action, see an observation from there, and, and so uh, loop back. So this loop part is essential, right? It should do something and then it should receive uh, the feedback from uh, action taken and, and uh, uh, decide what to do next. So we have a loop here, uh, and with chain, it's not really easy to organize. I mean, it's easy, you can just write normal Pythonic while true, and then call the same chain again, again, and store some messages on the history until you will have the final answer, and then you break, something like that. You can do that. But uh, in Langchain, they also write another like, library called Langgraph specifically for case when you need uh, cycles in your chain or in your graph in this case. So yeah, the main idea that we try to implement the simplest version of it, uh, it will look like this. So we have some entity called agent, right? That uh, could uh, receive some question and it has some set of tools. It has some actions that it can take. So it can optionally decide to take an action or, or like go to end uh, final node. So if it decides to go to and do some action, after calling the action, it unconditionally goes back to agent. So agent will see the observation and decide to what to do next. Uh, and yeah, this loop could, could uh, go uh, however however long it's needed, and then eventually we will end. You can maybe specify uh, the, some limitations of how long this can happen. So, uh, yeah, and uh, in order to do that, uh -huh. uh, we, again, this time we will use um, models from OpenAI, and they have models uh, specifically trained to have whatever they call OpenAI functions. So what is OpenAI functions? OpenAI says, hey, by the way, by the, when you do request, you can describe us a set of functions. Just the name, the description, what parameters they take. And uh, then as a response, we can either generate a text for you or we can ask you to call specific functions with specific parameters, right? And then it's your responsibility to call that function and uh, feedback with the uh, response. So we use that mechanism and uh, Langchain provides some interesting primitives to work with that. Uh, first of all, this tool decorator that uh, you can wrap your Python function with this tool decorator and it's do all uh, underlying uh, machinery to create a tool, something that then you can use as a open a function, therefore LLM can decide call this function if needed. And uh, also a lot of tools already written and lives in uh, community. So uh, we in this time will use uh, Tavili search, which is basically wrapper uh, uh, around search. You can imagine it like Google search. So your uh, agent can decide to do a Google search and receive results and then generate based on that uh, results. Okay, so yeah, here we just, and here what we try to kind of uh, create, right? Something starts from agent, it has ability to take actions and 
Um, so let's start. We just described our tools. So our tools is like this. Let's use three. Uh, reverse text tool, very simple tool. I provide a description. I provide these type annotations. And uh, Tavili search results, it's uh, from community package. Yeah, we create tool executor. We need this tool executor again to, uh, to uh, have ability to run them in our code. And we, we can call this tool, right? So uh, if you ask me something like card president of Armenia, it will return you some uh, responses from, uh, and you can see the name name is here, right? So, okay, then we uh, just initialize our model. We, uh, so tools is more uh, or less is a um, long chain specific term. We need to convert it to open AI functions. And we uh, use this helper convert to open AI function function. And yeah, if you look to what's, what is the output, it's just a, uh, like, it, it parses the function and says like the name is reverse test. This description is like uh, reverse the input text, what parameters is text. So nothing interesting happens yet here. Then we bind our functions to our model. Yeah. And then we want to define our graph. So our graph will be stateful graph. Uh, the state will be, since it's a chat model, so the state itself will be just a history of messages. So what messages we have? Like we ask something, then an LLM could respond either with AI message, with some text, or with a function call when they ask us to call some specific function. And we also could respond with function call message saying that here's a response of this specific function. So yeah, our state will be just a list of messages. And uh, yeah, call model will be not that responsible for our agent. So our, uh, 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 it will be responsible for calling the LLM. So what we do, we just get the messages from state, we invoke it, the new message appears, we just add it uh, to list of messages. So it's an additive, we described it here in our state. So everything we return from node will be added to list of our messages, right? And uh, then, uh, like we need to somehow decide where to go from our agent node. And for that, they should continue function as responsible. Again, we do very si like simple thing. We get our messages, we get our last message, and we check, is it a function call message or it's a normal message? So if it's a normal message and function call not in additional cavarks, we return end. And then this will, uh, we will go to end node. But if function call is there, we, we, call, we return continue, and then we will see it means we go to our uh, tool uh, function, and then we will go and call the tool. Here's a function to call a tool. Again, we parse our state with messages. We get last message. We know that condition already checked, so last message is a function call message, which means it has this uh, name and arguments uh, uh, fields, and uh, we can use our tool executor to call specific action. So we create action based on output, and we call it. And as a like result of this uh, function call, we uh, receive we, we create a function message saying that we call this function and uh, here's the result, and we uh, return it back to back to uh, our uh, list of messages. Yeah, and here is the time to um, kind of. Comp compile our graph. So we add two nodes, right? Agent and action. We say that for agent, the call model will be responsible and for action call tool will be responsible. We set entry point as an agent. We uh, add conditional edges. We say we have edges out from agent and based on response of uh, should continue function, it either will go to action node if uh, it returns with, with uh, it uh, continue, or it will go to end node if they should continue says add. And we just uh, 
add unconditionally age from action to agent. So when function message uh, added, then we need to call um, LLM again to like produce final response or decide what to do. So let's check. Yeah, I think I need run this one. And I need to run this one. OK. So now, uh, as I said, the state is uh, the state is a list of messages. We need to put something. Let's say I can ask uh, some human message, right? Also primitive from long chain. And then call our graph or our app with this input. So I decided to ask who is the current president of Argentina at March 2024. The reason why I did that, because this Tavili search, it has description that says that this tool is good at uh, responding to current time questions. And LLM decide uh, what tool to call based on that description. For example, in my case, in my custom tool that just reverses a text, my description is here, reverses the input text. So if it needs to reverse a text, maybe LLM not good at it like naturally, it will call this uh, tool. And in order to ask to call this tool, I say, please reverse the name, right? So I want the name of current president of Argentina and ask to reverse the name. And I call uh, invoke this um, uh, graph with these inputs. Da -da -da -dum. Da -da -da -dum. Yeah, so it returns us a list, the whole history, the state, and you can see that last state is a message, and it says the current president of Argentina of March 2024 is Javier Millet, and his name reversed is like whatever. So what's happened, if you look like to whole list, the AI message was a uh, function call, and it says, please call this Tavili search with current president of Argentina, March 2024 query, like it asks. After that, it receives some output from search, and then it asks to call a reverse text, right, with text uh, Javier Millet. And after receiving the uh, response for our custom tool, it was ready to produce the final answer. So if this uh, uh, not super convenient for you to check. We already know that we, in Langchain we can combine different parts. So we can uh, add a output parser again, and uh, you can combine different entities. Uh, so here what I do, I just uh, add another part that will extract last message from our uh, message history and give it to string output parser. So let's change the input. Who is the current president of Armenia, let's say. And not let's not invoke it. Yeah, okay. And now we can call this final chain that contains from uh, graph uh, with some cycles and agents and then output parser. So it will hopefully return us the uh, just a text. Please, yeah. The current president of Armenia is March 24th, is Vahagul Khachatian, and his reverse name, again, something unpronounceable. So, uh, if you want to see, like, how it works, I, yeah. We can go to Langsmith. <coughs> and I have project, like, specified for that. And you can see uh, that it could call, it could show you traces, like it could do a lot of things, but specifically it could show you traces of what's happening in your chains. So this case, this was a previous one about president of Argentina. It shows like what's happens, like first the agent decide to call chat open AI model. You can see input and output, like this was an input. Uh, who is the current president of Argentina, and he's the output. Zoom. Yeah, and the output was a function uh, call request, this function with this query, right? And then it goes to Tavili itself. It returns some information from 
web, then it calls reverse text, and then it returns uh, uh, the execution back to chat uh, OpenAI to agent, and then agent uh, finally respond with a uh, final text. So if we can see this last one with president of Armenia, it looks similar, but we just add uh, more uh, uh, extract output and str output parser uh, steps. So, but the main flow the same, right? It goes to un until uh, OpenAI and then to string output parser. So yeah. Uh, remember, I said that uh, we want to build something like this. So. LangGraph has the ability to visualize the graph. So if we want to visualize our graph, and this is something generated by them, not by us, yeah, we can see that this is how it looks, yeah? Very similar. So we have start, then here are two conditional nodes based on agent should continue. You have either end or continue. You go either to end or to action nodes, and from action you always go to agent. So this is the simplest, uh, like hello world example of long graph or some agent, you can make it as complex as you want. You can create a group of researchers. You can like, yeah, like just, uh, sky is the limit. So let me, I think, show the main chain, right? I don't know. Yeah, let's hear. And if you have questions, please, please respond to any ask any questions, after which you will have time to ask questions to Gore, I think. No questions? No, no, no. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, you also said that the uh, model decided to which functions uh, call. Correct. And uh, yeah, I would like to understand how it uh, works this process, because I think all of us know that uh, LLMs, it's just models that generate the next words of, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and. Uh, yeah. How this model decided to call functions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Yeah. Understand. So, uh, in this case, we use uh, Open AI uh, model, right? We use GPT-4, and this one, zoom. Yeah, and this one is particularly pre-trained to have this function call ability. So, what is function call? Your bind your description of your functions to your model. Basically, that means with each request, you send information about available functions in separate field. And then uh, model is trained to respond you with structural like output, with function name as with correct parameters. That's how it happens here, but this is just a specific model. If you have like very generic model, let's say, I don't know, uh, now some uh, models add ability to do this function call stuff. I think the latest model from Mistral also added, but let's say something else, some open source stuff, Llama. Uh, you can instruct, you can say, hey, you are a, uh, function chooser. You have these functions to call, you have this request, you have this task to accomplish. Please respond with um, relevant tool name with correct parameters. In this particular case, just, this just happened at the fine tuning stage for specific OpenAI model. So they have ability to respond you with uh, function call messages. Yeah, as a, as a JSON. So they have function name and the parameters for this specific function call. So asking to your questions like where exactly decision of uh, what function call happens, it happens like in uh, model itself. It's not our prompt in our case, just because this model pre-trained and have that ability to do. And it's do that based on, <laughs> and it's do that based on uh, this uh, like information, uh, description, and like parameters name, function name, stuff like that. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, I'm Gerg from PMI. First of all, thank you, Karen, John, and Gotjan for the the talks. 
a question to you both. So maybe each of you can answer uh, in their respective professional parts. So what are the uh, the biggest beginner mistakes uh, when doing making AI assistance? Uh, maybe if you can give like a top three. Great, I can give you top one. I, I don't have more. So I don't know if it's a mistake or not. We are live in really interesting time. I can start and then go with like answer with much, much better uh, answer. But I think the interesting uh, situation is like now we are all beginners. There are like new technology that appears, right? And we all need to find a way to write applications around that. So the patterns, how to use it, not yet defined. And let's say in long chain, they add a new things, new features, new approaches, like once per month or maybe even more once often. OK, once, uh, once per week. So I have no answer because there are no yet best practices. Uh, that's how I uh, understand that. Yeah. For me, I think it was uh, the mistake is like First of all, maybe stepping stepping back and understand not only just focusing on long chain uh, and how it does things, because maybe you just uh, start to think only in the terminology of long chain, but maybe step back as Karen also did and understand, okay, how it interacts with the model and what is model generally capable of. A uh, little bit having basics of uh, the understanding of LLMs or neural network, but basic as, in, in, as engineers, not as a data scientist. And then coming back, understanding how it interacts, because sometimes things happen and uh, it's buried in the code and it's uh, things like, okay, it looks like a magical thing, like how it understands that it functions and then it calls the tool. Uh, but there are even more uh, complicated examples. We decided not to uh, like uh, confuse you with them, but um, f two things like maybe it worth also looking into code because you may hear uh, all, almost everything is binded to with some uh, prompt engineering and this prompt engineering goes uh, in between the lines and you may think okay the, as usually the, there is a functional call to this to there but in between these prompts is ac accumulated and then you need just to use these tools maybe like Langsmith and so on to understand actually what is going on uh, um, because for me it's also a lot there are a lot of techniques you look and okay is this a magic or it's something it's how does that work so just try to debug as usually you do. And uh, yeah, I agree with Karen and uh, nobody is uh, probably, ex they are experts, but um, it's still changing. Maybe in one year, uh, RAG won't be that relevant, but the agents will be the main thing to do. And in two years, I don't even know what will, can, what will happen uh, with, uh, with everything that's related yeah. to LMS. And just another thing I want to add that right now we not covered a lot of a lot of stuff related to that, right? How to productionalize that, how to scale that, how to build UI uh, like around this, because right now we show it in Jupyter notebooks. Maybe you can use Streamlit, like it's very good tool for that uh, or, or other other frameworks to build. So for this talk, we just talk about like long chain and LLMs and how create chains and graphs. But in real world examples, you need to do much, much more to add like uh, have a final final product with some interface with monitoring with scaling with logging with all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, uh, but I think the main uh, basics are there already. So you can reuse a lot of stuff. It's, I didn't mention it, Karen didn't mention, but I did. Basically, you can uh, write everything yourself. Like you know some prompts, you know the API calls. You can do everything yourself from scratch. But as you can see, uh, especially with Langchain, if there's some new thing implemented in any LLM or any LLM provides new functionality or new, uh, maybe new pattern is arising, they are very fast implementing it within a week or two. And you already start to use this. You don't have to, uh, you like do it so everything from scratch uh, but that's also the option so i think um, as you can see already with this one year project and it's version 0 0.1 one whatever yeah 0 yeah. 0.1 version there is already uh, tracing uh, um, lang serve for the serving this api eight fast apis and uh, a lot of stuff so i i think when it becomes maybe 0.5 or 
point one will be very complete uh, solution after this. So the I feel uh, that the goal is just to explore it and start to use it and don't be afraid of this uh, LLMs. May it's much easier to already integrate in your uh, stuff what you whatever you do. Yeah, I think the last question maybe about this long graph stuff and then questions to Gore, if you have if if you have question no or in general to me questions. No. Okay. Questions? Any questions to Gore? Any questions to Gore? One. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>